the expectations is that we will have, I think, about um, 565 had registered by eight o'clock this morning. I haven't looked at what the number is. So let's see how we go. We are 325 at the moment. It's starting to slow down. Uh, could be people having internet issues and all that. While we add that, um, uh, Alistair, you saying where you are at the moment is quite hot. It's boiling, Casey. I mean, it's, it, it, it's completely unexpected. And of course, um, 31 degrees is almost unheard of in the UK and particularly where I live. So, I mean, we can't cope with it. There are people melting outside. I can imagine, I can imagine. Ulundi, where you are, how is it? Okay, see, I'm here in Pretoria, so um, it's a bit chilly, but warming up, I think that cold spell we had recently was not pleasant for all of us, but um, <laughs> no, I think it's warming up a little bit, which is good. Yes, yes. Graham, your side? Casey, it's a normal Joburg winter's day, so the, the, the days are absolutely beautiful, but uh, it's a bit cold in the, in the mornings and in the evenings. So it's a bit chilly this evening, but uh, nothing to can't deal with. So basically you're the same because I'm in Johannesburg and yeah, you're right. Um, I've not been going to gym for a while and I started running a few, two weeks ago. And uh, there was that particular week, weekend where um, we had the weather that we once experience in 2012, I think it was. It was very cold. I came back frozen because I've got these half um, uh, gloves. I was, it was so cold. And I even asked myself, why am I doing this to my body? <laughs> All right, it's um, two minutes past eight. And I think it's good that we start here. Otherwise we won't be able to finish. Uh, welcome to those that have joined us um, through the Zoom. The, so far, we are nearing the 400 mark. I see this. There we go. 400 exactly as I speak. Um, so let's see if we'll get to the 565 that I've registered. Um, I want to welcome you. My name is Casey Makubele. I'm the Chief Executive Officer at the South African Dental Association. If you have not seen me by now, it means you have not been attending this Zoom session. So yeah, you need, to come, you need to call me after this and say why you have not been attending these Zoom sessions because they're really, really helpful. Um, this is the, we are hosting uh, dental protection. Uh, normally we would, they would come down with a whole entourage, would go around the country doing this um, uh, uh, series of webinars or series of, of, of lectures. Today, they're coming through, through Zoom. So we have what, um, two countries put together, the UK here, South Africa here. So that's quite good. And that's why we are here at this time. Just on the administrative side to the members at 422 at the moment, is that all of you that are attending via the Zoom session, you do not need to do anything. This webinar is accredited. Uh, you will get uh, one CEU point. Um, and it's an ethical CPD point for coming to this. You just need to be here up until uh, the end of the session. I sometimes feel I must actually pick up on people that are registered just to ensure that they didn't just log in and then go and do something else and then only come at the end and switch off at least to get their, C their CPD points. Maybe I should do that. Uh, so be very careful. I may, I may call upon one of you to ask what has been said today. So yeah, anyway, you do not need to do anything. You don't write an exam. You just need to be here until the end. We are not encouraging anyone to raise their hands. We are encouraging everyone to please use the Q&A section to raise any question at any particular time during the presentation. So just type the question and then at the time allocated for question and answers, if your question has not been dealt with during the, uh, the, the, the presentation, we will ask that question and they will give you um, the information that you require. Please keep your, uh, your, 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 your screen on as well on the Q&A. If you go to the answered questions, some of the questions will get written answers. Uh, some of them will be answered directly verbally by the uh, various members that are on here. Having said that, let me introduce you to the speakers of tonight. Um, 
I will first speak in terms of the panelists and then the speakers. Uh, the panelists will include Alistair McKelvey. We all know him. Alistair, we love you. South Africa actually loves you. I still want to say to you, you should actually move from the UK and find home in South Africa. Really. I think you're a South African. Um, everything else is just a mistake. And then we have um, uh, uh, Olundi. Um, Olundi is going to be the main speaker for today. Uh, she joined MPS in March as head of service delivery for South Africa. She's a qualified attorney with extensive experience in medical law and ethics over the past three decades, including the field of clinical negligence and insurance litigation. Before joining MPS, Ulundi has held various senior appointments in a career, including head of the Human Rights Law and Ethics Unit in the South African Medical Association, as well as claims manager at Ethical. And we also have Graham. Um, many of you might have started seeing Graham around. Um, Graham Craig joined MPS in January. Graham has held several executive roles within the financial services market, and most recently as the chief executive officer of AA Insurance. Graham has extensive experience in managing geographic expansion, financial services, and operational functions for national and multinational companies. So currently, Graham is the Regional Business Development Director, MBS, and Ulundi is the Head of Delivery Services in South Africa, MPS. I said to her, I was joking with her earlier on, that because she's got a Zulu name, I wouldn't be surprised if she is one of the uh, wife of King Zulitin uh, in South Africa. And she said, you, you never know. So, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I want to give this over to Ulundi. I just want to indicate there will be an, a QA and a at the end of everything. And then we will go on try and finish at nine. If we do take more time, it will be up until 10 minutes past nine. Please try not to regurgitate questions. Thank you very much. Ulundi, over to you. Thank you, Casey, and thank you for everybody that has joined us this evening. So I'm going to start off the talk by talking about the new chapter that we have started in South Africa, the, the very exciting times we, we, um, we are going through. So I'm just going to share my screen to get to the presentation. So just give me an opportunity and please just confirm when everybody sees the the screen, can everybody see that? Okay. Now, it is indeed a very, very interesting time and an exciting time for us at MPS and Dental Protection to be able to be in a position to bring the cases and claims handling service onshore to our members here in South Africa. Um, Casey, you alluded to my background, and I've been I've been around the medical malpractice environment for quite a long period of time, and I've always actually wondered why dental protection and MPS was not in South Africa, and we are absolutely now meeting that need of the members and um, really focusing on putting our members first. So. Oops, there we go. So the background to the decision to actually move to South Africa and to start the operations in South Africa is first of all that South Africa is the second largest country by member number member numbers of uh, the MPS and dental protection following the UK. As a committed as a global organisation, the company and the organisation is committed to be, to becoming closer to the members and really to put our values that that is so important for us in our service delivery um, to, to put that to heart and into action so that we can better meet the needs of the members. I think it's, it's very important and we really need to, to, and we have listened to the, the calls of the members. The increased um, presence and the establishment of a presence in country will also enable us to deliver more specific uh, services, more, more member orientated for the local uh, healthcare professional um, environment, our healthcare services sector, and also to look at products that members may need in future. So much of, and, and Graham can maybe touch on that as well later when we talk about product development and, and really focusing on the needs of our members. Furthermore, the opportunity to have operations in South Africa will empower us to champion the profession 
at a time when it is most needed. And I think I don't have to say anything more than the current COVID situation and the challenges that the healthcare professions have had to face and continue to face. And I think those challenges are going to continue even post COVID from a cases and claims handling perspective as well. Also, we want to build on the strong and collaborative relationships with the, our partners in the, in the healthcare environment and in the healthcare sector, mainly the professionals, those are the people we serve, the professional associations, which play an, an incredible important role to us, and obviously other stakeholders and role players as well. So strengthening those the relationships and building on the relationships that we've had as an organization in the country um, over the many years uh, to, to, to actually really focus and strengthen those relationships. Now, currently the cases and claims handling service um, or services are provided by teams in the UK with assistance from local third party providers like local panel law firms, professional organizations um, mainly. And I think the, the first thing that I want to emphasize is that the fact that the operations are moving in country and the cases and, and cases and claims handling services are being provided um, by, by a new team that we are setting up does not mean that we are not going to rely and still have the relationships with our third party providers. Um, we won't be able to do it without the collaboration of the, the, our, the, the partners that we've had over the years. But what, what do we aim to achieve by moving in country? First of all, the local cases and claims teams will be the first point of contact with our members. The current and over the years, the services that have been rendered and are being rendered by the UK team has been brilliant. It's, it's an excellent um, service. It, I think it's going to be a challenge to actually maintain that service, that service delivery level, but we are definitely going to do that. We've got the likes of Alistair and our UK colleagues that will help us in that process. And with that in mind, you know, the aim is that if we have the local cases and claims teams operational, that we can have a, a local uh, voice, people, members that can speak to locally qualified attorneys and uh, people with the, the relevant experience to be able to understand their needs. Most of the cases and claims handling services will be delivered in house. Um, what we aim to achieve through that is that a lot of the services that are currently being rendered, I'm in the process of assessing exactly what the extent of the, the claims and case handling services uh, being rendered by Dental Protection and Medical uh, Protection Society, what that entails at the moment. But the goal ultimately is to bring that in our so that we can have that first contact with our members and just um, provide a, a greater service than what we are still uh, rendering at this point, which is already excellent. The team, the teams that we are setting up will consist of uh, case managers and case managers uh, assistants, claims managers and claims manager assistants, medical legal consultants and dental legal consultants. So that is the delivery services team that uh, we are we are setting up uh, in country. The team will also be supported by legal cost advisors and administrative personnel so that we are able to have a full spectrum of service delivery to our members. So where are we? Currently recruitment is ongoing. Um, some of the members that have joined us this evening may have seen some adverts that were placed at various platforms and media regarding roles that are available. So the recruitment is currently ongoing. All new starters, once they have been appointed and have been um, onboarded in the, in, in the organization, will undergo proper training, thorough training, and will, will have to undergo a competency assessment before they actually start assisting members. So the assurance that I want to give um, members here and, and other members of the profession is that they, at no stage will the quality of service that is currently being rendered by dental protection be compromised. Um, that service will continue until such a time as that we are ready to take over and continue at the same excellent standard of uh, service delivery that, that is currently being rendered. In respect of premises, we've identified three potential sites in the Victoria East area. 
obviously as a result of the lockdown regulations, site visits were, were uh, problematic and were limited initially with the lifting of some of the re restrictions. We are now in a position to actually go and inspect sites and do um, assessments of preferences so that we can identify the most suitable premises. The, the aim is to have our office set up by the, around September and October this year so that we can actually have um, a physical presence, a physical office where even members can engage with us as well. Insofar as starting the starting date for operations in country, the communications, and I'm sure many members received uh, communication early in the year from dental protection as to when, they, when it was announced that the, uh, or the move to, to move in country was announced. We were looking at a period of 12 to 18 months to get the operations um, going. We are still on track to stay with, with that timeline. So currently we are working on a time frame of around nine to 12 months. Obviously the, the COVID pandemic and all the challenges that presents is, is unpredictable and which is why we allowed ourselves enough time and uh, contingencies to make sure that the operations are properly set up before um, we, we take on any operations in the country itself. So in a nutshell, that is basically what our plans are in respect of delivery services. Um, and yes, that's, I will now hand over to, to Graham. Uh, thank you, Lindy, and thank you, KC, and everyone who's joined us this evening. Um, you, Lindy, if you could just skip to the next slide. Um, I, I want to make a statement. I mean, that, that is that dental protection is different. And what I mean by that, as a mutual not for profit organization, our main purpose is to do physical time in the What you've got to do there is basically in the country. A relationship to to get in to have been engaged by the relationship. in contact, make sure that we are listening to what others are saying, we are providing feedback, we are providing the next slide, please. Expect from the relationship, and this probably the most important one thing that I've read all in our team on a daily basis that we exist to create regulations and financial security of our members. That is our main purpose, that is what we do while we are So, what we can expect from your relationship manager is to ensure that you have the crew and dignity product to support you and things wrong. Is to ensure that you have access to bespoke risk programs of risk in the minimized areas in the first place. I'm sure a lot of our members are aware of our prison platform and uh, the valuable content that can find on the platforms. But what a, what a relationship manager will be doing is assisting you with the registration, informing you of any new content, and helping you through that process so that you can get the most benefit out of our risk prevention services. I think the most critical thing for your relationship manager is to learn about your individual situation and ensure that this information is fed through to dental protection. We are very keen to make sure that we have an active um, line of communication between our in-country team and obviously dental protection and make sure that any concerns or queries or anything else is, is fed back and we can actually action on that. It's the data my personal recommendations to resolve any objections that you have and ultimately in country contact. Sorry, Graham. Yes, I, Sorry to interject. I think your line is breaking a bit. Okay. So may I please ask you just speak slowly. Just speak slowly. No problem. Uh, is that Thank better, you. Casey? Yes, perfect. perfect. So Yulindi, if you if you can go on to the next slide for me. Um, if I can say, mentioning with what Rupert said, that, that he is a reminder of us, you know, um, 
how the interests of our members and have to be everything that we do. And I'm sure a lot of our dental professionals are aware of the relief initiative that we want. We're a very interesting product to make to go out and say you don't too much with structural relief to our members in country. Uh, I mentioned as a mutual organization, you know, there's never been more cause and concern for us to use our opportunity powers to step in and offer the flexibility that the participants need. It has not been about its challenges, and you know, it is actively engaging with our members in countries to ensure that they can be and relief and to assist with the process. And I need to say for a session, it's a we have had some in finding a viable solution and finally get that moment back our members and the We will continue monitoring the government situation and we will determine if any additional need to be made to the level and to that we are offering. And I think the most important element of this is there is no expectation of members to be paid as a primary that we are offering. Graham? Yes, Graham. Casey. I'm, I'm going to, I do apologize. I'm going to stop you for now. I think let's carry on with Ulundi because you're really, really breaking bad. Um, can yeah. Ulundi carry on and we can come back to this section, please, Ulundi? Great. Okay. Um, let me just now get the slides going. Um, the slides does not want to move on for some reason. Um, okay, so I'm just going to stop sharing and then I'm going to reshare the screen if that's okay with you no problem just what we're just waiting for graham to um to the attendees we do apologize there seems to be a a link or an in down um okay there seems to be an internet breakdown from Graham at this stage will get back there while Ulundi is preparing to carry on with the presentation. Can everybody see my screen, Casey? Yes, we can. All right. So the main focus of my talk is going to be um, to focus on liability and professional indemnity. Through the years, this is probably one of the biggest problems I've seen whenever members encounter problems um, or issues with patients is that there's, there's sometimes a misunderstanding or a misperception as to how the legal, um, requ what the legal requirements are and how does it actually work in our legal system regarding liability and the role of um, professional indemnity. So, First of all, I think it's important to focus and remind, to focus on and to remind members on what the acceptable business models are that have been approved by the HPCSA. In September 2015, the latest policy on business uh, practices were published, and the following categories of business practices were basically approved by the HPCSA. So, first of all, the solo practice, which I think all members are familiar with. And then we've got partnerships, associations, personal liability companies, or, typ or typically known as incorporated practices, and then fr franchises subject to compliance with certain with the ethical rules. It is also important to note um, the provisions in the ethical rules and the requirements in the ethical rules, and particularly ethical rule eight, which allows for the employment of other practitioners providers that are registered with the HBCSA. So apart from the business practices, we, we members can work together and, and form uh, business relationships. There's also the employment uh, option available. So let's look at the employment relationship. Now that is typically where there's an employment contract, 
uh, one practitioner employs another practitioner as a professional assistant. So all the requirements for uh, an employment relationship is met or are met. Um, this relationship is subject to the basic conditions of employment act or the other labor legislation like the labor relations act from a liability and specific specifically from um you know professional indemnity perspective it is important to explain and get and have members understand the what vicarious liability in our law means because that that is the the principle that is applied in our legal system where the employer is held responsible and and, and is liable for the the acts and omissions of the employee so anything that the employee does whilst in the employee of the employer um, that may be deemed negligent any harm that a patient suffers as a result of that will then be the, the, the entity liable for the compensation of that damages will be the employer. So this is not often very clear to members. So I just, I, I'm going to explain it by means of um, some, some graphics. So first of all, we've got the employer who employs a professional assistant, the professional assistant properly contracted with the employer has and uh, treats a patient, the patient is unhappy. And what we all know, what typically would happen and what we all expect is that this patient will then issue summons or lodge a complaint against the treating practitioner because that is the person that actually caused the harm. So yes, there may be liability on the part of the uh, employee and that is typically the understanding, but based on the principle of vicarious liability, this patient can then also sue and hold liable the employee, oh, the employer, apologies. And the employer, based on the principle of vicarious liability, will then be held liable and um, needs to then compensate the damages caused by the employee in that, uh, in, in, whilst in the employer of the employer. And I think it's very important that, that this is, is actually clearly understood because very often this is where we see things falling through the cracks we practitioners practitioners don't realize that it, because they are not the treating practitioner that they are almost exempt or, or um, go, you know protected against any liability as a result of the negligence of the professional system when we look at legal entities juristic persons the, this is now typically partnerships, group practices, associations and incorporated practices, the personal liability companies that I refer to. What we would typically see there is that one, one partner, one doctor will start uh, uh, with colleagues, set up an incorporated practice. And it's very important here, yeah, because this is very often we, we um, practitioners sometimes don't realize the implications of setting up an incorporated practice or a heuristic person is that that incorporated practice or heuristic person or entity legal entity actually becomes a, a heuristic person like an individual a legal individual if i can call it that in itself so so if this incorporated practice then employs other practitioners, so they work for the, the professional assistant will then work for the incorporated practice, will then treat the patient, the patient is harmed, um, and the patient is unhappy. The first reaction that we expect is that the patient will then institute action or lodge a claim um, and a complaint against the practitioner that provided the treatment. So the liability will lie there. However, based on the fact that the professional assistant and the, the treating practitioner is in the employ of the incorporated practice, there will also be a liability on the legal entity of the incorporated practice, this juristic, uh, the juristic uh, entity that was created by the three main partners um, or directors. And I want to emphasize something very important here is that even though if, if I can just go back, we can say that there is a liability for the, the heuristic person, 
the, the incorporated entity in itself. The reason why it's a personal liability company, and for instance, why practitioners are not allowed to practice as uh, PTY limited uh, as, as a business model is because under the PTY limited, they can limit their liability um, against any, any claims or any uh, civil action that may be brought against that legal entity. In a personal, li uh, personal liability company, uh, incorporate practice that is not possible. So this means that if the legal entity does not have proper cover, then the three individual uh, directors in that company or the partners will in any event have to share the liability that was incurred on behalf of the legal entity. And this is why it's so important that um, members and practitioners really understand the implications of liability and the, the importance of professional indemnity. It's important also to highlight and discuss the role of independent contractors because this often gets very confusing to members as well. Now, if a doctor wants to get a colleague to help out in the practice, but he does not necessarily want that colleague to be an employee, there is the option to engage that colleague as an independent contractor. Um, Two aspects that's very important in the, in the agreement in, in that uh, example or in that scenario is that the, the independent con, uh, contractor agreement that is uh, entered into by the two practitioners must clearly state that it is an independent contractor relationship. So as to remove any doubt. The reason for that is, is that in terms of our labor legislation, in certain instances where a contractor renders services or works for a particular entity or individual, there can be circumstances where that contractor, even though the parties both have the understanding that it is um, an independent contractor relationship, that there are instances can occur where this contractor can be deemed, in terms of our law, to actually be an employee. A typical example is where the contractor is under the direct um, control and direction or instructions, receives instructions from the, um, the, the first practitioner. Um, the, the, the independent contractor uh, receives most of his or her income from the uh, principal practitioner, if I can call it that. So it's very, very important that in those independent contractor agreements that the relationships are clearly defined and clarified as an independent contractor relationship. Now, in both instances, be it an employment agreement or be it an independent contractor agreement, there are two critical provisions in respect of liability and indemnity that all practitioners need to make sure are properly covered and adequately um, provided for in the agreement. Now, I'm focusing here on, on liability and indemnity, but I just want to, on a side note, make a comment in respect of it. Uh, what I often uh, advise practitioners is to also include in these agreements, be it in the employment agreement, or be it under an independent contract agreement, to include a requirement that, first of all, the um, employee or the, or the independent contractor must be registered, obviously, with the HPCSA and maintain that registration, which is, we all know is legally required, but also remain in good standing during that period um, of employment or the duration of the independent agreement, uh, with, the, with the, the independent contractor agreement. Um, I think that's sometimes, sometimes something that is, is not always uh, really th uh, thought about because it's assumed it's, it's professionals, but it, I do advise from a legal perspective that it is a good provision to include in the contracts as well. So to deal with the, um, the HBC is a good standing element as well. So that at the moment that a complaint, for example, for example is lodged, against one of the employees or against the independent contractor um, that they actually report that to the principal uh, practitioner or the employer that a complaint has been lodged, that the employer and the principal practitioner at all times know what the risk in, involved is with regards to the independent contractor or the employee. 
In respect of liability and indemnity, an absolute non-negotiable in any employment contract or independent contract agreement would be that the employee or the independent contractor provide sufficient proof of or adequate proof of professional indemnity. So that must be a non-negotiable. I often get asked the question, so what does, um, apologies for that, what does adequate professional indemnity entail? And what I always advise to members is that it must be indemnity that is adequate given the risk associated with the services being rendered by the employee and the independent contractor. And that is something that either the employer needs to um, assess and discuss with the employee or with the independent contractor so as to make sure that the proper and adequate, especially I want to emphasize adequate professional indemnity um, is in place when that agreement is entered into. What I also recommend and what is also to me a non-negotiable in any of that, uh, in, in both of those agreements is the obligation to maintain professional indemnity for the duration of the agreement. Now, it's very important here that members understand that the difference between the types of indemnity that are offered, the, the dangers, for example, associated with um, a claims made product that is um, only covers you for the period that you have paid the premium for that particular year, and that does not necessarily ensure uh, proper cover in future. So it's very important that members understand the difference between claims made um, products, the obligations under claims made products uh, typically offered by insurers, because that can, that can you know, being a lawyer myself, um, you know, the devil is in the detail. Um, very often practitioners, unfortunately, don't always read the, in, in the, the contracts properly. And then when a claim is instituted, then they realize that they were not aware of their obligations or did not understand exactly how the, um, the cover works. So it's very important that that is um, understood. As I say, the, the obligation to maintain the indemnity for the duration, but particularly with future claims, sometimes it takes years for a claim to be instituted or a complaint to be brought against the practitioner. And if indemnity is not in place to cover those instances, then it can be problematic. And we have, I mean, I've seen in my career instances where practitioners have had to carry the liability personally, and that has led obviously to disastrous results in respect of the careers and the, the, the financial positions of those uh, practitioners. So that is basically what I wanted to focus on to, uh, tonight in respect of uh, indemnity and the importance of, of making sure that you have indemnity that will cover you in future for, for claims and that uh, in, in from a contractual perspective that the indemnity aspect is covered properly for the, du the duration and for the extent of the of this when uh, when the services are rendered. That is basically my my part of, of the talk. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now, and then I'm going to hand back to you, Casey. Thank you very much, Ulundi. I think at this stage, if we can try and capture what Graham wanted to present, um, whether you need the slides, Graham, or you can talk without the slides, uh, because I think you're just trying to explain the local office. Can we try that? Um, if when you are speaking, we still have a problem with your sound, I'm gonna ask that maybe you switch off the video and speak on sound only, but let's try it for now. And please listen to my cue on whether it is working or not working. Can we try that? Thank you, Graham. Uh, great, thank you, Casey. Uh, is this a bit better? Yes. Uh, so I, I think the most critical part of uh, the presentation is about the infantry team who are there to support members and provide them with the, the necessary, you know, supports with any queries and actually filter any questions or concerns that they have directly back to through to dental protection. That's the first element. 
The second element is with regards to uh, our unprecedented move to offer subscription relief. And I just wanted to talk through that. So it, it really is, it was a very easy decision for us to make to offer two month subscription relief to our member base. Um, uh, we are aware that some members are experiencing some challenges uh, with regards to uh, getting money into their bank accounts. And that is where I offer and say, look, we will be in contact with them directly. There are dedicated relationship managers who will be in contact with our members to assist them through that process. The critical components to know there is that I need to stress that the relief that we are offering is not repayable and it will not impact future subscriptions. It is something that, you know, I mean, it, that serves our purpose, which is to look after the financial well-being of our members at this time and make sure that they are protected. Um, we will continue to monitor the situation and if any additional support is required, we will be in contact with members in due course. Uh, Casey, I, th I think, you know, I mean, that is it really in a nutshell. I mean, if you, I'm more than happy to take any questions on that. And I, I think that the whole element here is the team is available. Uh, you'll see in the slide deck, we have provided that the mobile telephone numbers of the relationship managers in the respective territories. You are more than welcome to, to contact those uh, relationship managers with any queries, concerns, comments, suggestions, or anything else that you have with regards to dental protection. I've put my contact details in there as well, and I'm more than happy to deal with any question, concern, or anything else that any member wants to have a discussion about. Thank you very much. Just maybe another, another comment is that the slides and the videos are going to be available on our uh, website and our Facebook. So should um, members want to get that detail, they can get it there. I will, with, with Graham's uh, permission, I think what we will also do is to take that slide with the details of the people they can contact and I can add that onto my next SADA right um, with whatever Graham would have written in there, whatever he wishes, and you will be able to actually get that uh, with our communication. Having said that, I would like now to thank you very much to both of you Ulundi, thank you so much. Graham, thank you so much. Let us now go to the questions. There aren't that many. Myself and um, Alistair, we've been answering those that were pertinent. Uh, for those of you that are attending via Zoom, if you go to the middle of the section, you can see of the ones that have been answered, majority of them were about the sound. We do apologize that we have lost the sound at the time that Graham was speaking but he's just summarized what he wanted to say earlier on. And we, in terms of the information, we're gonna make that available. So let's quickly go to the questions. I'm gonna ask all my panelists to unmute themselves and you can really just um, uh, take the question if you believe that this will help. Not quite sure if this is something that you want to answer or is in your space, but let me ask the question. Shouldn't qualifying dentists be required to first work two years under supervision before they can open their own practices. I su suppose the person is saying that um, uh, when they come out of university or ComServe, they don't necessarily have the uh, experience that they need to have and maybe they should do this. Now, I don't think it's necessarily about the presentation today, but maybe you have an opinion. Um, maybe let me start with Alistair. What's your opinion? Yeah, thanks, Casey. I see this question coming through, and I, I I gave it a little bit of thought because it was too difficult a question to answer because I didn't know why the question was being answered. But you know, there there is a problem with dentists who come out of the Comserve year. Some of them are very very well equipped to go into private practice. Some of them are not very well equipped to go into private practice. So. Essentially, when you go into that first year after ComServe, your L plates are on and you really need a good mentor in your practice to help you get out of those difficult situations. The Dunning-Kruger effect also applies in that situation because, you know, it, 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 you, you just don't know what you don't know about treatment. And dentistry is hard enough just managing to do your restorations without managing the patient that's attached to the mouth. So 
it is a huge learning curve, just what you're taught in, in, as a dental student and then in your first year in ComServe is the start of a long journey of learning and competence. Now, the, the, the question is, so, so should there be a supervision year? I, I think it's a very good idea. And I know that some independent groups in South Africa, like Bridging the Gap, uh, are, are trying to help dent, young dentists bridge the gap and develop the skills and the experiences away from uh, the treatment clinic. But um, everybody's got to start somewhere. And my experience of dentistry tells me that um, you, you, you really don't want to be driving at 100 miles an hour when the fastest speed you've ever gone at was 50. So it, it's, a, it's a gradual thing, but we need good mentors, we need coaches, we need help, and we need to understand when we need to ask for that help. And sometimes it's not obvious. I just want to add um, something that SADA has decided, and hopefully it may not obviously benefit those who are already out of the system, but we are hoping to introduce a mentorship program, hopefully from next year, um, which will pay a young dentist to an experienced dentist over a period of time. Um, and we are hoping and I'm praying and I'm asking to all our experienced dentists to please make themselves available to assist other members so that we can improve our dental profession. Thank you so much. The next question, if I signed a contract with a medical aid to be a preferred provider for their patients, they can also be held responsible for my mistakes, open and close quotation marks. Um, is that the understanding of the team? And of course, then they say, Sada should warn them. Um, maybe I can, I can take that question. I think it's very important to distinguish the um, the preferred provider or designated provider contracts with the medical schemes, because that is a contract in respect of rendering services at a, at a particular, well, specified services at a negotiated rate in terms of the, um, the Medical Schemes Act and the regulations. So it's important that practitioners understand that the medical schemes um, or the managed care organizations, they don't, they're not the entities that actually render the service. So the, the treatment is still being rendered by the professionals and they, they, therefore they carry the liability in respect of uh, any harm that results or flows from the treatment of that, of that patient. And I think we must be, be careful not to confuse a funding a funding arrangement with um, a liability or, or indemnity um, arrangement. Very, very simply, Yolande, the dentist is the duty of care, the funder. Exactly. Thank you so much. Um, I think this question has been dealt with, but uh, um, the, 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 the second part may be something that uh, the anonymous may want to send to uh, Alistair or Graham. Uh, says on uh, onshore office. Does this mean that the attorneys and defence are all in house and not going to be not going to use Mac Robert, etc.? Who, to be honest, they had terrible service and were quite useless. May I suggest to this member um, that you please write to Graham and to Alice? I'm sure they will be keen to see what the problem was and deal with it. But my sense is, as much as even even if they do have in-house um, uh, lawyers, you will always want to go outside if you want to get more uh, skills and more resources. So I'm sure they can deal with that. I don't know if uh, any, uh, uh, Graham or Alistair, you want to add anything there? I think I think that's probably your Lundy's question to answer <laughs> because this is right up our street. Yes, yeah. no, um, it, it's, it is my question to answer. Thank you, Alistair. Yes, so I think it's important to clarify when I said most uh, cases and claims handling services will be will be rendered in-house, it is not everything. So in terms of our uh, legal framework, for, for example, if formal legal proceedings are served on a member like a summons um, or any other uh, process, legal process um, piece, then we, we do need panel firms um, and we will still have panel firms and we will always have panel firms to, to render that uh, support and to be, to be to, uh, available to our members in any event. So um, we, we don't have the system in South Africa where in-house attorneys, um, we, we 
I mean, I'm a qualified and admitted attorney myself, but I cannot go on record in a formal litigation like a, uh, where a member has been summoned. So we will always brief panel in those situations and panel will always have a role in, um, in our engagement with our members and, and reading services to our members. Thank you so much. I'm going to ask that we speed it up a little bit. And if you are, if your question has already been asked, please do not add. I see 22 questions that are outstanding. I'm going to be quick. Is a local dentist which works on commission regarded as an employee? Yes or no? Um, depends on depend. It depends on many more factors just than just being employed or engaged on commission. Um, if let, let, let's put it another way. If if you pay a dentist the, the same salary every month and there's a contract of employment and they're paid while they're off having their holidays and they get sick pay and they have employee rights, then they're likely to be an employee. And there's a traditional employer-employee relationship there. But th this is such a difficult question that, 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 that needs to be answered in more detail, probably away from this forum and probably through SADA and maybe with the help of Bunkash, um, SADA can review the whole contract situation. But the reason why we wanted to raise this problem was because uh, attorneys in South Africa acting for patients are now targeting both the practice owner and the dentist who carried out the treatment. And uh, the, just by accident, it, there is an employer-employee relationship when there's not meant to be one, then it puts the owner of the practice at risk. And the, the owner of the practice must remember that the indemnity they have is for their own professional risk and not the risk created by anyone else that works for them. Thank you. Um, I think the second one, the next one is really a comment. Uh, all my dentists are getting three months notice tomorrow. Let us hope that they are not going to harm any patient before finishing the three months. We hope so as well. But I would, I would suggest that you probably have had a very good relationship with them, that there won't be a need for them to harm your patients. We also trust that they, uh, they respect their professional responsibility to cause any problem. Thank you so much. The next one, what do I do if I discover that my locum is not up to an ac acceptable standard? and I want to terminate his service, I suppose his or her service, but I can't, I can't according to labor law. HPCSA is so slow to get any reaction from them to assist me in to suspend him. I then will be forced to keep this locum in service and pray and pray and pray. Okay, I mean, I can deal with the ethics of this. I can't deal with the employment law side of this but I'm assuming there's a disciplinary process that you can put somebody through for, poor, for consistently poor performance. I, th I, I think that any practitioner who oversees or sees incompetence and in patients coming to harm must do something about it. Now, um, what do you do? First of all, you approach the individual and say, here are some examples of what I think are very poor treatment. We need to do something about it. So initially you provide support. But if, if, if there is the ignorance of arrogance or the arrogance of ignorance and the practitioner is not willing to listen, then you've got to take whatever steps are necessary to stop harm for those patients. And that does include reporting the individual to the HPCSA. Whether they are responsive enough to protect patients, we don't know. But an individual practitioner, by whatever means, would need to stop a dentist from harming patients in their practice. Thank you very much. Um, do you want to add anything, Ulundi? Yes, I just wanted to conf echo what, what Alistair was saying there regarding the utilisation or the use of labour legislation in South Africa, um, either be disciplinary or poor performance, and that those mechanisms must be used. They are there for a reason. And I mean, if, if a, if a locum is posing an, a threat to patients, then they should be suspended pending, pending uh, investigation as to what, what's going on because a practice owner cannot run the risk of a locum continuing or um, the risk being there that the patient may be harmed. It, you, cannot, mm. you cannot allow that. I think, I think that the, the, the issue is that anyone can and should follow a proper um, labor uh, process. 
and you don't have to wait for the HPCSA. If you can prove that they are, uh, they are substandard and you follow due process, you can actually terminate the services, but follow due process. With regards to professional indemnity, what would you suggest would be a good option? Now, uh, Dr. Uh, Ramian, it's not a question that we can answer here. My suggestion is you either contact the local DP office or ourselves, as in SADA, speak to Joseph. We will then ask you a few questions to ascertain what level of practice you are in, what do you do, what don't you do, and then we can make a recommendation. Unfortunately, at this level, we are not able to give such a recommendation. The next question, if I'm- Casey, can I just, can I just remind uh, the audience that Bonkash, um, through either the bulletins or in the SADJ wrote a very good article about different types of professional indemnity. And that would be a very good reference point for the individual who's asked this question. So maybe you could signpost that um, particular article. Yes, or maybe they can just uh, phone the office and we can help them. Uh, Graham, do you want to add something? No, the, the, Casey, I was just going to say, or they can contact their, their relationship manager in their region and they're more than happy to have a conversation with them as well. That's Absolutely. Excellent. Absolutely. If I employ a locum or work as a locum, does it mean that it has to state in their contract or my contract that I or they are an independent contractor? That's question part A. Do I understand that correctly? My practice is registered as a PTY LTD. Is that better for me legally? So there are two parts of that question. Okay, I I think, can, the first yeah. part is if the locum is, if the intention is that the locum is going to be an independent contractor, then obviously the contract needs to state that clearly. I just want to emphasize something that practitioners sometimes also don't um, realize is that in terms of the ethical rules and the policy guidelines uh, from the HPCS, a, a locum can only be utilized for a maximum of six months. So it is very important that they understand the role and the purpose of a locum in, in the, in the uh, provision of healthcare services. So that's the first aspect that I want to emphasize. So it depends on what is agreed between the parties, whether it's an employment for six months or, whether, or, or for a period or whether it's an independent contractor. In respect of the, um, sorry, uh, can you just- PTY? The PTY Yes, but the PTY limiteds are not uh, allowed in healthcare, so I will not encourage any practitioner to practice under PTY limited. Thank you very much. Um, I want to answer this question, and you give me marks, uh, Alisa, if I get it right. It says, good evening from Dr. Rousseau. I would like to know if DPL, which is DP actually, does cover us for claims that arise years after treatment, when during that time we were covered by DPL. I think, let me, let me, let me, let me paraphrase. If, the, if the, the, the claim arises from a treatment that occurred when you were a member of DP, the answer is yes. Even if it comes years later, as long as the claim arose from a treatment that um, uh, that happened when you were still under DP, you are fully covered, you don't have to worry about anything. But if it's a claim that occurred when you're outside of DP, that that's not covered. Do you want to confirm that, Alistair? Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, there's maybe been that question's been asked by more than one person, but I have put an answer up to, to uh, I don't know if it was Dr. Rousseau that I answered to. Look, all of you guys buy occurrence-based indemnity for us. And what, what it means is that we give you a long-term promise. So providing you are in membership, paying the correct subscription on the day you pushed a route into the antrum or provided implant treatment that wasn't appropriate for that patient. It doesn't matter how many years after that event that somebody decides they're going to sue you you will be able to request assistance from us. So this was part of our roadshow last year that we talked about the differences between occurrence-based indemnity, and indemnity and claims made. Occurrence-based indemnity gives you peace of mind. It is, it is indemnity in perpetuity forever. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Dr. Kingsley, when will members receive communication regarding DPL subscription relief. I think Graham tried to deal with this. Do you want to deal with it again? 
Yeah, so uh, Casey, I mean, if the doctors, our communications have gone out, if you have not received uh, uh, an email from MPS or Dental Protection, please feel free to reach out to your uh, relationship manager in the region or contact me directly and we will definitely assist you with that. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Whitley asks, do you mean that a legal, a legal entity like an incorporated company should have its own separate DP uh, policy for the company? Then each practitioner should have their own policy and every director also have their own policy? It's a question. Okay, so I'll answer the second or third part of that, Casey, that every individual dental practitioner in South Africa should not be working without their own indemnity. Uh, and, 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 and that's almost non-negotiable now. And it may become enshrined in law, but Graham can maybe pick up the bit for the entity and the, and the indemnity for the entity. So with regards to the, the indemnity for the corporate, it is uh, definitely something that the, the doctor or member needs to consider. And once again, you know, it is something that they can have a discussion with us about, and we are more than happy to assist them through that process. Thank you so much. Um, the next one, is there any type of pro forma contracts? I think that's what they wanted to say, pro forma or templates that DPL SADA recommend for independent contractors? Probably you can answer that, Casey. Because... <laughs> yeah, I was there already typing it. So we have put, as SADA, we have put quite a few through Pankaj, we have put quite a few templates on employee contracts on our website. Please go and have a look at that and see which one would suit your uh, particular uh, need. If you need to talk to us, please call an, or email Pankaj. Um, legal at sada.co.za and he will be able to assist you with that. But we do have quite a few uh, uh, employee contracts on our website. I can't remember specifically on this one. The next you question. Know, you, Yolande, maybe, maybe you want to come in there because it may, be, I'd, it may be within your plans that you might be able to, in the future, offer members some advice around their contracts of employment and contracts for service. No, absolutely, Alistair, because, you know, in as much as a, a, a template or, um, you know, a, a draft contract is, one can use that, I always caution practitioners against the one-size-fits-all approach because, you know, you need to be able, a template is a template, but you still need to look at that template and, and check the wording as to whether that is actually applicable to your situation and amend, to amend it accordingly where the, the situation differs. So be very careful. It's very, it's very useful as a guidance, so, but be very careful for one size fits all. And definitely in our future plans, we, it is something that we want to address. Thank you. Uh, does DP cover dentists with disabling hand conditions who practice in a limited capacity? Okay, the answer to that is yes. Um, I think in a, in a situation where there is uh, a medical condition that might impair your fitness to practice, I think it'd be very, a very good idea to have a medical occupational health certificate that says you are fit to practice. We, would, we, would, we do not make it a condition of indemnity or a condition of membership that you must be fully fit and operating correctly. Thank you. Um, might have skipped one. As, as an independent contractor, I found it difficult to make the DP payments over the past two years, working part-time and being a single mom. Can I still be hired with a clause in the contract that the employer won't be held liable if I don't have DP cover, basically? Okay. So in other words, can I contract out of liability? Okay, can I make the employer contract out of liability? Short answer, so the short answer to that is no, because of the principle of vicarious liability. Um, so, and, and remember, you know, in any civil claim, when the parties are cited, they are jointly and severally liable in any event, depending on the um, nature of the liability. So the short answer to that is no. Okay. I think this one, I'm gonna to skip to the next one, but Dr. Whitley is very similar to this. If I employ a dentist that, that does not have indemnity as an employee and a patient gets harmed and take that dentist to court, does my DP 
protect me from being sued by the patient for work he has done wrong. Okay, so, if, so, yeah. so I mean, we, we've, we've actually answered this yeah. question. So yeah. let, let, let me just be very clear about this, is, is that if you have a dentist working in your practice, what will generally happens is that the patient pays money to the practice and sees that the, the patient does not understand the relationship between the practice owner and the dentist who work there. So what we are seeing is we are pay, seeing patients trying to sue the owner of the practice as well as the individual dentist. If the individual dentist has no indemnity, then the lawyer or the attorney instructed by the patient will go after somebody who has money. Now, the owner of the practice, as I said, has indemnity with dental protection. That indemnity is for their own treatment error and nobody else's. So they are only indemnified for their own professional practice. Now, if the patient comes after them for, for compensation, for a mistake made by another dentist working in the practice, then you are not indemnified in that situation by dental protection. And that's why we are bringing this to everybody's attention tonight, because it is a serious risk that people are unaware of. The only simple answer right now that I can give you, and this is not a marketing point, is that make sure if the practice owner is a member of dental protection, make sure that everybody who comes to work in your practice is indemnified by the same indemnifier, because that is the only way to, to resolve the problem. What we are seeing is we are seeing the commercial insurers who always have uh, some small print saying that if, if there is another insurer indemnified, this policy is no longer valid. So what you'll find is that if they see there is an employer-employee relationship, they will say, aha, we don't need to pay out insurance here because you are employed and it is your employer who is responsible for your acts and omissions. And this is a problem that we need to talk about and we need to address. Thank you very much. The next question is um, very, very similar to what you've answered, Graham. Uh, it says, my two months DPL relief does not correspond to the subscription that I've paid for the whole year. I have sent emails without an adequate response. Do I contact SADA? I think if you can explain what is 212 of what they need to get back, maybe that's not fully understood. So, uh, Casey, thank you for that. I mean, uh, when the subscription relief was, was calculated, I mean, currently members pay subscriptions based over 10 months, and you get an analyzed figure. But when the subscription relief was calculated, it was calculated on 212. So it's looking at your annual premium, dividing it by 12 and multiplying it by two. Um, so that is how you get the factor of the two month subscription relief that we have paid. I'm more than happy to take it offline or the members more than happy, uh, I'm more than happy that they can contact me directly and I can take them through the process uh, and we can uh, you know, kind of move on to the next question there, Casey. Thank you. I don't have much time. I've got two more minutes and then I'm going to cut the discussion. So let's see what we can get in. Does a dental therapist working under supervision as a full-time employee need DP cover? Yes. yes no? Okay, that's perfect. Um, with regards to vicarious liability, if the employee is adequately covered by DP, would the employer still be held liable in the situation where a problem arises? The, the answer is that, that provided the, the, if the, if the owner of the practice, the employer was also a dental protection member, it's not a problem. It, the problem comes where there is a difference between who indemnifies the owner of the practice and the individual dentist. We, we are an ethical and a responsible indemnity organization. And if it was the dentist working at the practice who was sued, then we would sort that problem out. Thank you. Dr. Padayachi says, will DP consider a product that provides for income protection whilst in self-isolation? Um, so I'll pick that up, Casey. I mean, uh, look, at the moment, uh, our, our core focus is on uh, indemnifying members for their acts and emissions. So it's not something that we have looked at, or I don't think it's something that we would consider at this time. Thank you. Um, Dr. Balenson is just uh, giving up a, tes a testimony. I have a dentist that is employed by me on a long-term basis. Um, has been working. So I suggest, I think that it means it's been, the relationship has been working fine. 
Um, will DP be able to supply us with an example of such a contract, an independent contract? I would suggest that, yes, once you guys have uh, uh, done such a, a contract, you will, be, you will make it available. Um, I think, I, I, think yeah. I would just say, while we're, while we're willing to, to offer general advice around co business contracts, it, it, this, is, this, is not, uh, this is not our area of expertise. Um, we would, we, in, in every other jurisdiction we work, we would really expect the dental association to be the providers of contracts of engage, contracts for service, contracts of employment for dentists. This is really very much your, up your street, Casey. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Ramson um, asked, this is a good idea to have a local office, uh, but service from UK has been excellent thus far. Is this not just pushing up operational costs and members' expenses to have local staff and office? This is not about costs. I mean, I, I, I don't think that there, there is a cost implication. In fact, the opposite. Um, but um, the, the idea is to have this local service. Right now, um, the, 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 over, the, the, the running costs of a business in South Africa is actually less than in the UK. So um, Graham and Yolundi will know more about the figures and the projections and the strategy here around costs. But uh, I, I'm, I'm pleased that Dr. Ranson thinks that he's had an excellent service or she's had an excellent service from the UK. And the UK will continue to be involved in a service that's locally based. So I'm not going anywhere. All right, I'm going to jump around and look for some key questions, two more questions and I'm gonna stop. I think this may be important. We're a group of dentists in private practice. We have been closed since lockdown as we don't feel certain as to whether it is safe for us to, uh, and the staff to return. Are we allowed to remain closed? We have provided a referral to the state hospital for the emergencies and a few other local dentists in the same locality. Very similar to what we discussed on Tuesday, but let me hear you guys deal with this. Okay, so, um, I mean, there are, there are obviously very genuine reasons about wanting to remain closed. So that's a decision that the owners of the business have to make, that they, they wish to remain closed. I think that what I would say is the, is the, the SADA protocols, the cross-infection protocols, the PPE that are in place are all there to protect you from any infection transmission risk. So the safety ought not to be a worry, but we have to take into account individual circumstances. So I don't really know what the reasons are, but uh, if you are closed, then you lose your business because your patients will have to go somewhere else. And if you're a private practice, which I suspect you are, then uh, if you're not going to open, then the only way to retain your goodwill is to come to an agreement with another practice locally that is working and refer your patients there on a one-off basis. Okay. And the next question, guys, just allow me because I think the three are linked. This one says, um, uh, why does DPL not cover dentists when they work on patients in government clinics and universities and only offer advice? Okay, because the, the, if you're employed in the state sector or in hospitals or by government, the state sector provides you with claims indemnity. So. Thank you. You're working in that environment and you accidentally or negligently harm a patient, then any claim will be paid by the state. Thank you. Does a dental assistant require DP cover? No. Only this, this will only become an issue if the dental assistant actually renders treatment to a patient. But the dental assistant is generally employed by the, the, the owner of the practice, and they are unlikely to, hopefully, not uh, treat patients unsupervised out of their scope of practice. So until the scope changes and dental assistants are involved in actually delivering treatment to patients, then there is no requirement for them to have indemnity. We're gonna conclude with this question. It's a clarity question. Do I understand or am I clear with my understanding that dentists are not allowed to practice under a PTY LTD? And I think this is for you, Ulundi. Yes, the understanding is correct. I cannot practice as a PTY limited. Thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna conclude here. I'm gonna ask uh, from Graham, any last words from you? 
No, thank you very much for your time, Casey, and we, we look forward to servicing our members in country. Thank you very much. Ulundi? Yes, absolutely. Just uh, echo what, what Graham has said there. It's, it's exciting times. We're looking forward to uh, establishing the office uh, in South Africa and be able to render services to our members here. And um, it's it, it, yes, thank you for the opportunity to share our, our, our plans. And uh, Alisa, lastly. Yeah, I'm just I'm very interested in the in the sorts of questions being asked tonight because um, we we th there's a sort of general theme coming up here that suggests we need to address some of those issues and it, and it, and looking at the number of questions coming through it may be that we need to have a part two to this webinar maybe with better sound from Graham but I think there are some key issues and it may be something that we can do jointly with to have Pankash involved here and try and answer all these indemnity que queries because there are some serious issues out there and there's some situations where you as the practice owner will have indemnity with us, but we will be unable to protect you if there is a claim against you where treatment has been carried out by somebody else working in your practice. Thank you. I also, when I look at these questions, I see a slant towards labor issues that need to be looked at. And obviously the labor issues is the pressure caused by the COVID-19, the closure, the reduced number of patients, all of those things. And I think this is the time that we need to work with our, with our members to assist them to make sure that they don't, in the process of dealing with the cost issue, they don't cause another problem by not following due labor process, which may actually cause them more than what they sh should have cost them. So I see that coming through and maybe uh, besides a, a, a webinar, as part of what we can do is look at these questions and maybe take a few key concerns and deal with those on a communication um, collaboratively between SADA and uh, DP. So we can we can look at that. Um, yeah. So if there's any key questions that are still there, we're definitely going to find a way to deal with them either directly through DP communication or a combined communication or through a SADA right. But one way or the other, we're not going to leave them. Uh, lying there. We do apologize. We cannot go any further. Uh, I just want to say thank you very much for all of the people that have joined us. At one stage, we had about 525. On the Zoom, we had about 59 um, on, the, on the Facebook. So I do thank you for joining us. We hope that we can bring more and more of this so that we can, we can, we can um, help you. Um, and what I would like to encourage members, if you feel there are certain specific topic that you want us to cover, please do send us an email, uh, send it to Marlise, uh, you can send it to uh, Dr. Metzim uh, at our offices, and we will look at those, put them together so that we can get the right expertise to come and talk to you. But we want to thank you for coming and spending time with us this evening, and thank you to my speakers. It's been a lovely evening. Everyone, good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.